Well, good evening. evening. When the saints go marching in, and the longer I serve him, the sweeter it goes. And so I'm going to ask that you would please stand and let us worship the Lord Jesus in song, and then we're going to be seated and have the offering. Yes. Time we're gonna have our offering. Brother Ray. Want to also pray for Ed tonight. Uh, Ed, you know, was here this morning, but he is uh, gonna have his uh, carotid surgery on Tuesday. He's been trying to get that done for some time and uh, keeps getting postponed. What's that? What do they do there? Where? Now, what do they do there? Uh, well, they're probably going to open up, open up, put a stent in. Mm -hmm. All right, let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you brought us back together tonight. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus. <laughs> and we especially thank him for what he's done for each and every one of us. We look forward, Lord, to, to your work tonight from your messenger. We pray, Lord, that, that we leave here serving you. We ask also a special blessing on Ed Childs, Lord, as he has this pending surgery, that everything will go well, and that he'll be able to get his strength, and he'll be able to do the things that he's been accustomed to doing in the past. Thank you, Lord, for knowing Ed and, and all the time that he's involved and been involved here at this church. Bless this offering, Lord, so that this offering can be used for your ministry. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's it right there. We're going to start talking. Here we go. I had a loving brother Death released him from sin And I promise I will serve him When the saints go marching Oh, when the saints Oh, when the saints When the saints go marching Go marching in Oh, when the saints go marching in Oh, I want to be in that number Saints go marching. I had a precious sister. I had a precious sister. She has called on me before. And I promise I would meet her on that happy golden shore. Oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints, when the saints go marching in, go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. I have a Christ like Father. I have a Christ like Father. Far beyond the blue skies. And someday I'll surely meet him. With the Vino said, with the saints. Oh, with the saints, with the saints. Go marching in. Go marching in. Go in the saints. Go marching in. Savior, I have a living Savior. He redeemed 
to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have song in 1965 is called The Longer I Serve Him. You probably remember George Beverly Shea, who died at 104. Yes. The Longer I Serve Him. Turn it over to our pastor. My preacher seat, is that right? <laughs> all right, all right. Well, it's good to be back tonight on this Lord's Day evening. 
Uh, and the plan tonight is to kind of continue on in our um, a look at denominational divides and just kind of thinking about uh, the Baptist denomination, if you can call us a, a denomination. But before we get into that, I do want to throw it open. Are there any questions about this morning or anything y'all want to ask or talk about? Like I said, I've been requested just to ask that, just to, if it's on somebody's mind, just to... Well, I just know that you talked about the, that we're one, and I know some people may have doubt because of uh, that, because of the fact that so many beliefs in, in, in these things, you know, and so you know, I just wanted if you state more about that in a sense of... Well, there's, in, in Ephesians 4, it says that we have one Lord, we have one faith, we have one baptism, there's one spirit, there's one God and Father of us all. And so there, there is a, you know, a unity, a unity in the body of Christ. You know, even there's a, a basic set of beliefs that all, all Christians hold in common. Now, we do disagree over, you know, might say some secondary or tertiary things, um, but but the primary things all Christians believe. Amen. I mean, you know, because if you don't believe those, you're not a Christian, you know, and so the, there is something we all hold in common. Now, we might do baptism a little different, or we may, you know, we have maybe a different emphasis, and a lot, really a lot of our denominations are over secondary things, you know, how's the church governed, how are, you know, there's there's different things and some of these things are are good to have a distinction on but but you get down to brass tacks and and you know we you know we hold to a common faith thank you uh okay well we're gonna uh well let me go ahead and throw this out for the um the last time we we met here on Sunday night, uh, there was a question asked about missionary Baptists. We're going to talk about Baptists again tonight, but there was a question about missionary Baptists. Played a little stump the chump, and the the chump was stumped. I believe Ellie. I think you're the one that got me. I was like missionary Baptist. I you know I know a little bit about, but you know I had to go get some education. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, What's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let, let me just give a, a before we we get in our thing tonight. Just give a, a brief uh, thing about a, a missionary Baptist. And I do have, if you're interested, I have a little handout here from uh, some things about about missionary Baptists. But there was a, a controversy over the issue of missions uh, in the in the 1800s. It was really over kind of how you do missions. Uh, there were pro missions Baptists and some. They were called, I mean, anti-missions Baptists. Or they really weren't anti-missions, but it was just the, the, the methods of evangelism or how, or how is it that you, you go about doing missions? And it was kind of, because as Baptists, we're really big on the autonomous local church. That's really big about Baptists, you know, the, the independent autonomous local church. And so when you think about doing missionary work, what does the role of the autonomous local church have to do with missions? Some Baptists thought that all missionaries ought to come from the local church. And you really shouldn't have these mission societies and associations and, you know, kind of the way we do missions in the Southern Baptist. And so there was a, a divide over kind of how you do how you do missions. Some thought that having some of these missionary societies with your blinking hands with a whole bunch of other people that it uh, it. Uh, it it had an ill effect on the autonomy of the autonomy of the local church. There I, there is a, I've got a few of these here that uh, Stephanie printed off about some stuff that the missionary Baptists say about to themselves themselves. Uh, there's a statement here on how they do evangelism, at least according to this, and I've I've seen it elsewhere that uh, uh, missionary Baptists, at least in th this group, that they op oppose certain types of evangelism. They oppose easy believism and 
asking people to say the sinner's prayer and repeat after me and just kind of these methods of evangelism they're not real big on. In fact, some of them uh, really, really oppose it. Uh, their statement of faith in here uh, is actually the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. Um, the last time we mentioned the Philadelphia Confession of Faith, which was kind of a broader confession. The New Hampshire was kind of a, a condensed and maybe a softened version of that. And it's the predecessor to our Baptist faith and message. Uh, so it, it's a really, it's a great, it's a great confession of faith. Uh, but if any of y'all are interested in, you know, looking a little more, uh, at least of their statements on that, you're, you're happy to. But like all Baptists, uh, in what I've looked at, missionary Baptists can run the gamut. Uh, they can go from very conservative to very uh, to very liberal, uh, very uh, pro pro progressive. I, I couldn't find, though I saw some indications that some missionary Baptists that are predominantly black Baptist churches, that some, maybe they might be a little different than other kinds of missionary Baptist church, but I'm, I'm really not for sure on that. I did find a general missionary Baptist convention in Georgia. And I didn't know if that had reference to do with like the General Baptist and particular Baptist and the Calvinism Arminian debate. I, I really couldn't find uh, stuff on that. But some missionary Baptists uh, are affiliated with the SBC. Others are affiliated with the American Baptist churches uh, of the USA. And the American Baptist churches is, is the group that when the SBC split off, the other part, what you can essentially turn into the American Baptist churches and the SBC has become a little more conservative and the American Baptist has become a more liberal they uh, accept and promote women preachers as well as homosexual preachers and so they've really kind of gone gone way, way liberal but again the you know as far as missionary Baptists they can you know they can run the gamut from the American Baptist to the SBC to landmark Baptist which are really really conservative that hey, we come from the very, the very, uh, you know, from the from the very founding, or they can be none of those, or independent. I don't know, you know, but but that's my little spiel on on missionary Baptist. And so, if any of y'all want that, there's there's some of these copies here. So, you stumped me last time, so I, I hope that's at least uh, the, the addressing it just just a little bit on the wide variety of, of, of missionary Baptist. Does that help at all? Or, yeah. but all three that I've been in, just regular Baptist, missionary Baptist, Southern Baptist, they all have the same. I've, yeah. It's been the same for me in each one of them. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, there's, like I said, their statement of faith is almost exactly like our statement of faith, you know, and, and there should be some commonality. Um, and, if, you know, if you go back far enough, there, there, there is, there is, is commonality. And, the one that I was in, uh, I was in, was the Baptist Missionary Association, the BMA, mm -hmm. and their uh, seminary was in Cabot, Arkansas. That's where most of their preachers oh, okay. come from. And uh, they were very conservative. As a matter of fact, they were not against Southern Baptists, but they thought that the Southern Baptists were very, very liberal. Mm -hmm. And that was their thing. They were very conservative. Very conservative. But there wasn't really anything any different in the belief mm -hmm. at all. Just the way the money was spent was the only thing I could yeah. That well, was the only difference I saw. Yeah, people. some Baptists, they, you know, it's it's like, no, it ought to come directly from the local church. And others say, hey, no, we, we can partner up with other people. And they come yeah. home on furlough missionaries, whether they have to go to different churches to raise money. Mm -hmm. So you could, you know, in in the means how to go about doing missions. And so they yeah. couldn't do much. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, why don't we start off with the word of prayer, then we'll, we'll hop back. Uh, in, uh, into this. Our Father, we do thank you for bringing us uh, back tonight that we can sing and, and pray. And, and Lord, we do pray for Ed and for his uh, health and pray for the, the skill of the physicians that will be attending to him. And uh, might they uh, use uh, the abilities you've given him uh, to his good. Uh, and it might uh, and it might improve, improve his health. And that, Lord, maybe you'd be just pleased just to, just to go ahead and heal him. Um, and uh, Lord, encourage us tonight as we think a little bit about, about our heritage uh, and encourage us in our most holy faith. In Christ's name, amen. 
Okay. Well, uh, the last time when we've been talking about kind of the denominational distinctives and divides, kind of some things that uh, divide the one church, you know, into some of our uh, unique things that we kind of put the, put emphasis on. Uh, we talked a little bit about the origin, of the beginning of Baptist, and we kind of had two distinct beginnings because there were from the very beginning we were separate from the beginning. Uh, there are kind of two streams or two tributaries of Baptists that kind of began in the early in the early 1600s out of the Protestant Reformation and Puritanism and separatism. There were the General Baptist and there were the Particular Baptist. Uh, they uh, again had these different uh, views uh, over the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, a general atonement or a particular atonement. And so this Calvinism or Arminianism debate was from the very beginning within Baptist life. But that debate is really not particular to Baptist life. Uh, you can you can trace that debate in a lot of different denominations, uh, you know, th really throughout throughout church history. Uh, but so that was really not a Baptist distinctive. Uh, at least something that maybe separated Baptist from from other from other groups from other uh, denominations. Um, uh, but there, there was, I might say, a main Baptist distinctive. Um, and this separated the people that became known as Baptists from, from other Protestants, from other separatists, from you know, all these other groups. And, and, and it kind of united them over, uh, well, uh, th this issue was a big issue for uh, the people that became known as Baptist. And it was a quest or a push for a pure church. Um, Baptist from the beginning of Baptist really had an emphasis that the church, the, the local church, because they're really big on the autonomous local church, that they, they wanted and strove for that the local church would be a pure church. And then and, and they took this a little farther than other, other Puritans because the, the, the Puritans, I've heard of the Puritans, the, the Puritans wanted a pure church. You know, they, they broke away from the other, other Protestants and from the, the Church of England because they said, hey man, there's, there's still some corruption going on here and so we, we want to purify things up and the Puritans wanted uh, things that were pure. They said, well, we need to have a pure doctrine, you know, and so, you know, let's, let, let's not have any corruption in our confession of faith and let's, you know, really kind Kind of get down to our doctrine. We want a pure doctrine, and not only a pure doctrine, but let's be pure in our action. That uh, you know, we don't want you know, the, the priest and whatever you know living a corrupt lifestyle, or the people in the church. You know, you, we want a pure doctrine, and we want a pure lifestyle, a Christian lifestyle, pure in life and pure in doctrine. That was kind of the Puritan thing. You know, that was part of part of what they wanted to do. But the the Baptist Puritans, if, if, if you will, the Baptist Puritans wanted a pure church in doctrine. Uh, they wanted a pure church in action in the way that, that the people in the church lived. But they also really pushed for a pure church in church affiliation. That is, they wanted there to be a church affiliation by regeneration. You remember when we went to the Baptist Faith and Mesh, you remember what regeneration is? It, it's the new birth, the, the Spirit giving us a new life. And so one of the main Baptist distinctives or something that, that Baptists kind of separated themselves out from a lot of other Christian groups was over this issue of a regenerate church membership. This, is, this was a distinctive that you might call it a Baptist distinctive. That Baptist from the beginning wanted a pure church. Um, that the people within the church should have a, a personal and an individual faith that is evident for all to see. Um, they said you must be born again. That was you know, re you know regeneration. That you must be born again in order to gain membership in the local church. And again, Baptists were really big on the autonomous local church. Well, how do you become a member of the church? Well, you must be born again. 
you must be a born again believer in order to be a member of the local church. Again, they wanted a pure church. A church that its members were visible saints. Uh, when the saints go marching in, and they just didn't have the name saints, but they had the life of saints. They were visible. It was they were they were evident Christians. They were evident believers, and so so it was over this issue that that really became a Baptist distinctive that kind of separated these Baptists away from the Congregationalists, away from the Presbyterians, away from the Anglicans or the Episcopal, Episcopalian, you know, and all the other little groups. The group the people that kind of came known Baptists says, no, we, we push for a regenerate church membership. Now, now the separatists who kind of started separating out even from the, the Protestants and saying, hey, you know, we, we got to fix a lot of this corruption and doctrine and corruption and action and how Christians are living and they're not living like Christians. And uh, uh, so it's just separate out. But, but they gave four reasons to separate. You know, why, why do we want to separate out and, and to kind of make our own group? And their four reasons were this. If there's a false worship going on, if there was false ministry going on, if there was false discipline of the, the people in the church going on, and if there was false membership, a false basis for membership, as that is how people actually became a member of the church. And so this became a, I mean, I, some have called this the Baptist distinctive. The, the one thing, I mean, there's other things that different Baptist churches we argue about that every other church argues, you know, but, but something that kind of made us unique uh, uh, is this quest uh, and this push for a pure church. Now, now, now let, let me just give you um, a, a little illustration. Does, does that make sense at all? Did I, did I communicate that? I mean, to see that? Okay. Let, let, let me just give you an illustration. Yes. I'm just curious, would you term that also as pure as tied to holy? Same, same. Yeah, that, 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 that would be part of pure. It should be pure in the doctrine and our, the confession of faith, pure in action and living a holy life. Um, but pure is that to be a, affiliated with the church, to be a member of the church, you needed to actually have a good confession of faith and a good life of faith. And that this needed to be to, to, to be you know to be evident for all. We'll talk here in just a little bit. That's why we rejected infant baptism, um, you know, because it it goes it goes against this 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 main this main principle of Baptist that that to be a part of the church you need to have a personal individual profession of faith that is evident to all. Um, and, and then let me just see if I can give an, an illustration here about. Um, or some illustrations about the importance of a person's individual personal faith um, uh, having uh, to do with the church. Uh, I, there was an article that came out a, a few weeks ago. I, I read um, uh, and it said something to the effect: uh, if, if if your pastor's sermons sound a little robotic, it may be because they're produced by artificial intelligence. <laughs> And it was an article on the kind of oh the coming prevalence of preachers using AI, artificial intelligence, this computer, I don't understand it, using it to, to come up with their sermons. Um, and I actually talked to a guy several, uh, several months ago who's done that. And he's used it, and he's like, man, this is, gets a pretty good sermon, and it works great. And, you know, you just plug it in or whatever, and it spits out a sermon for you. And, yeah, did you? That sounds like cheating to me. <laughs> that you have, I tell you, out of the mouth of babes, right? That is exactly right. It sounds like cheating. Because you know what? It is cheating. Because I can tell you that if my preaching is not an expression of my personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only a performance. It's just a religious exercise. It's just a, a hypocritical performance. It's an actor job. 
And if I get somebody else to do it, I get a computer to do it, and I find, you know, and it's not an expression of my my own faith. It's a fake. It's cheating. Yeah, did you, somebody had their head? Okay. You mean like the, getting it off the internet? Yeah, I, I, I guess there's the this artificial intelligence, the chat GPT or whatever. I guess you can plug in anything. You, I've seen it where, you know, come up with a hymn, come up with a, well, you can get it to, to, to print your sermons. You, I mean, there's, there's actually services uh, that a pastor can hire and they'll, they'll do all the work for you, you know, and you tell them what you, and, you know, and, and it, 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 it's uh, very, very clinical, very professional, but not very personal. Well, well, how about copycat sermons? Yeah, well, we, we, we've had a problem with that in, um, uh, in, in Southern Baptist life, too. People preaching other people's sermons. But again, I, I'm just using this as an, as an idea. Just think about it. If, if the sermon is not an expression of personal faith, it's a fake. It's just a performance. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just uh, take the spotlight off of me for a second. If the singing is not an expression of personal faith. It's only a performance. Uh, if the playing, if the praying, if the giving in the church, if all of the things that we do in church life when we come together, if when we sing and when we play and when we pray and when we preach and all these things, if these are not flowing out of an expression of the person's individual personal faith. It's only a religious performance. That's all it is. It's only a religious performance. And if church membership is not a matter of and an expression of someone's individual personal faith that is evident to all, it's only a performance. That, 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 that's all it is. And, and this is, you know, I use those in, as an example. That Baptist, one of the things that, that separated us away from, from other Christian groups, they're saying, hey, when we gather together in the local church, you know, we want to get rid of this superficial performance religiosity that's not a matter of the heart. You know, it's, it's got to come from someone's individual personal expression of faith or it's just a religious performance. Mm -hmm. We need a regenerate church membership. Yeah. And you know, to, in today's society, that's what people are looking for. Yeah. They want to go to a church that's going to be a performance. Yeah. That's right. And they're not getting the word. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, 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 so this issue that, that, you know, Baptist held and they said, you know, this is really important. You know, that we're really big on the local church and the autonomous local church. But when the church comes together, we, we want to do all that we can to say that the church membership is a regenerate church membership. Now, now there's a, a passage of, of scripture that I'll... Baptists differed on an interpretation of, and it's, it's in Matthew 13. Uh, well, more than, but turn to Matthew 13, verses 36 to 38. This is the, um, this is a, where Jesus, he's given some parables, and here he's given the, uh, the, the, the meaning of a parable that he gave, uh, and it's uh, the parable of the field with the, with the wheat and the tares. Okay. If you remember this parable, he tells a parable that there was a landowner. Uh, he went out and sowed good seed in his field, and at night an enemy came and sold, you know, sowed tares, weeds in the field, and all of a sudden it started growing up together. The servants were like, dude, you know, what, what's going on here? Didn't you plant good seed? How did these weeds get here? And, you know, should we go out and tear them up? And he says, no, 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 don't, don't do it now because you might disturb the wheat. Just leave it until the end. Uh, and and, and then, then we'll sort it out then. Well, Jesus explains it. Uh, uh, let me just begin reading in verse 36 of Matthew 13. And then he left the crowds and went to the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. 
and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Now, we're not going to get into, into all of this, but, but this passage of Scripture has been interpreted by I think most people in, within in Christendom that the field oh, is the, well, let me just put it this way. The field is the world, not the church. And a lot of people in, in the, theologians in church history have interpreted this saying that, no, the field is the church. And the church, you're going to have the wheat and tares in the church. It's going to be a, a mixed group. St. Augustine taught this. It was very, very, very popular teaching that, 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 that their view of the church, the, the visible church, was, well, the church is going to be full of wheat and tares. The church is going to be a mixed crowd. And really, Jesus says, here, we don't, don't separate them out until the end of the age. We really shouldn't do anything to try to separate out the believers and the unbelievers from within the visible church. We should just expect this mixed group within the local church, and we should try not to weed it out. Now, I, don't have, I, I know you're a gardener. How, how many gardeners are in here? You, you, you all go, okay, now imagine telling a gardener, don't weed your garden. I've got the biggest. You got, don't, okay, now this interpretation of this passage of Scripture, that the, that the field is the church, and you shouldn't weed the garden, if, if, if you will. That's kind of where, you know, most denominations uh, uh, fell. But Jesus doesn't say that the field is the church. What does he say? The, world. the field is the world. The field is the world, not the church. That in the world, in all of the world, yeah, you've got, you've got a mixture of believers and unbelievers, of God's people and those that, that, that are the, the, the devil's people. And, and Baptist said, you know what? Uh, we should really try to keep the world out of the church. This should really be a, a part of the ministry of the local church, that when the local church gathers together, we should really work hard to keep the world out of the church. And a regenerate church membership saying that, hey, you must be born again, an evident believer with an evident Christian life in order to be a part of the membership of the local church. This having a regenerate church membership was a key Baptist distinctive. Essentially, Baptists were saying, you know, um, we ought to at least try to weed the garden a little bit. You know, we, if this is the garden, we, we ought to try to keep the weeds out. Um, now, no church, you know, we, we, we can't get them all out. There, there, there's no way. I mean, we, we can only look on the outside. We can't examine people's hearts. But Baptists from the very beginning said we don't want to intentionally plant them in the life of the church. And this was a big distinction. We do not want to plant unbelievers within the life of the church. And so Baptists wanted to keep unbelievers off of the church rolls. And this was a Baptist distinctive. We only want a regenerate church membership. People that are, have a clear profession of faith and are living a Christian life. And this is who makes up the local church. And this was a dividing point uh, within these denominations. Because, you know, even after the Protestant Reformation and there was these uh, split, that, uh, there were vestiges of Romanism and their Arminianism stuff that, that filtered down into the, into the Protestant churches. When they separated out, they, they brought a lot of uh, that, um, that stuff with them. You know, and it's, it's probably in our, our church uh, too. But Protestantism, even though they broke from Rome, brought pieces of Rome with them in various forms. 
And one of the big things that a whole lot of Protestant churches brought with them was infant baptism. This was a huge deal that was part of the Roman Catholics. And that, yeah, and they broke from the Catholic Church on a lot of different things, and great, we're, we're with them. But one of the things that, that they annexed and said, hey, we really, we kind of like this deal, and they brought infant baptism with them. And, and you know, many now different Protestant churches, they view infant baptism in, in different ways, but, but many within Protestantism, they, they connected infant baptism with circumcision in the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, it was part of the covenant. You know, I mean, you, the, 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 the child of a believer, the child of the, the, the Jewish family, you circumcise the male child, and then they're brought into the community just by, by reason of birth. By reason of an affiliation with a family of faith, then the children were automatically brought in because of the sign of circumcision. And many within the within Protestantism, they just said, hey, you know, it's just like baptism. We're going to take the Christian sign of baptism and we're going to apply it to the children of believers. And this brings them into the church, even though there is no personal faith. And just like in, in Judaism or in the Old Testament, you know, it was just kind of thought that, you know, if, if you're part of the physical family of faith, if your daddy's in and your granddaddy's in and you're, you have a family affiliation with the faith, then guess what? You're probably in. You're circumcised just like the rest of them. Or guess what? You're baptized just like the rest of them. And you're in like Flynn because of a of affiliation, a familial affiliation, without any personal faith. And, and you know that the Jews had a big problem with trusting their family lineage. That, that was part of their faith. Hey, we come from Abraham. We're in like Flynn, right? John the Baptist come baptizing and, you know, he's baptizing a baptism of repentance and all these Jews were showing up and some of the big religious leaders. And he says, hey, dude, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You know, why, why are you here? And he says, and don't say in your hearts, we have Abraham as our father. Don't trust in your family affiliation because he says God can raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Your family connection physical family connection has no bearing on the life of faith if you don't have a personal faith. Um, in fact, let me just read from, from Romans chapter 2. And, uh, from Romans chapter 2. And do you know, this is, this is the new part of the New Testament, okay? And this is something Baptists hammered on. Part of the new part of the New Testament is saying, no, it's a person's individual per you know, personal faith. It's not a family lineage. Okay, um, Romans chapter 2, let me read verses 28 and 29 here. Uh-oh, I got the wrong chapter. That was a good one, but the wrong one. Okay, Romans 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward and in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Here he said, you know, these, these physical attachments to the family of faith, whether it's circumcision, whether it's baptism, whether it's whatever, really don't count for anything. They don't, they don't mean anything. They don't automatically bring someone in. It's a matter of the heart. And, and Baptist says, hey, you know, said, okay, the, the Protestant church, we've, we've recovered the gospel. We got a, a better, you know, we, we got back to the biblical gospel where Rome had, had correct, uh, corrupted it. But, but guys, y'all did not go far enough because salvation is not a matter of family affiliation. It's not. That faith is not a matter of family affiliation. And church membership is not a matter of family affiliation. 
That it's all it's a matter of one's own individual personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and, and that's the basis on it. But man, when you start messing with the family, um, I tell you, people fight for the family. Yes, they do. And people fight for power. And this issue of infant baptism and the power of the church, that was a big, big dividing point. Because I, I'll tell you, infant baptism was such a powerful tool in, in the Roman church. Because the Roman church in being able to baptize your children, I mean, essentially they were, they would say in baptizing and doing that, we are dispensing regeneration. You're getting the new birth. We're washing away original sin. They were dispensing regeneration and they were dispensing salvation. Onto your little ones. And there's not a parent here who doesn't yearn with every fiber of their being for the salvation of their children. I mean, can I get an amen on that? I mean, we, we want our kids to be redeemed. Amen. And when a religious group says, hey, you come to us, cha-ching, we can get them in. And, and you know that, that in Roman Catholicism, if, if a child was unbaptized, I mean, if, if they didn't go through the religious ritual, if they weren't on the roll in that way, you, you know where they went when they died? Yeah. You, 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 you ever heard of limbo? Uh -huh. You know, getting, I mean, you ever heard of that term limbo? We kind of get, you know, we say, hey, you know, limbo in the, in the dance. We try to do under the thing, you know. Well, I guess it is for us a little bit. But in religious terms, Roman Catholic terms, limbo. They don't get to heaven. Huh? They're somewhere else. They don't. They are exactly. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know if it's quite. quite I mean, I, I I've tried to look. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll sort of agree. Yeah. Like like in between go and stop. Yeah. It's it's uh, unbapt, unbaptized children in in that view uh, go to limbo, which is kind of like a, a holding cell. I don't know if it, it's hell, uh, purgatory. Um, it's not heaven. It's not hell. It's limbo. It's oblivion. That, that you know what? If, if you can come to the church and, and go through this religious ritual, we can get your family in, and guess what? If they die, then they, they won't go to oblivion. They still practice that. And I tell you, that is such a powerful, manipulative tool on uh, people's hearts. Because as I said, parents want to ensure the salvation of their kids. And the lure of the idea that, hey, I'm a person of faith and somehow I can transfer my faith in some way to these little ones that I love. That, that, that is so alluring. And I think especially if you think about it, you know, in, in that time frame, you know, infant mortality was much, much higher in the past. I mean, it, it was not uncommon for, for families to bury several little ones. And and you could I, I I could feel the pull myself you know if we when I think of Barry and Minnow you know and we this this thought of of our our little one and going into eternity and I want to do all that I can to ensure it but I can't I mean Jesus is the Savior um, and so this this issue of infant baptism. And what about my little ones or my little ones that have died in infancy was such a powerful, powerful pull on families. But Baptist said, no, we, we only want a regenerate church membership. That it doesn't make any difference if you're, you know, you're a person of faith and you have the kids but until the kids have a personal expression of their own personal faith then they're not brought in 
to church membership. And so this was a huge, huge dividing point on, hey, do we fill our roles with the names of our children, our infants, you know, because they have gone through the ritual, um, even though there's no evidence of a personal, of a personal faith. And so, so does that, that makes sense at all that, of, uh, of, of this? I said, I, I don't know if I could, you know, I'm not a historian, but I, I think this may be the Baptist distinctive. You know, we got other things we debate in-house and with each other that other denominations do and, you know, whatnot. But this issue right here was kind of what separated Baptist from the other separatists. Uh, this issue of a regenerate, uh, a regenerate church membership, and I would just say that really, you know, Baptists. I think we've moved a long way from our original foundations, uh, from where we where we were. I mean, whether it's the particular Baptist and the general Baptist debate, or especially maybe over this issue of regenerate uh, regenerate church membership, because you know this idea of a regenerate church membership with went hand in hand with how we govern our local churches and our church polity. Well, what, 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 what kind of church government do we have here at Classen Boulevard as, as a Southern Baptist? Uh, you, know, we, you know, we have, do we have a hierarchy where one guy's kind of ruling it all or is it a, a church elders where a group of guys is making all the decisions? How, how are decisions made here in this church? Um, it, 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 it's a vote by the congregation, right? I mean, we, we come to, guess what? We're going to have a business meeting on Wednesday night. We're going to come. We're going to talk about issues of the church, the things that go on, you know, just how the, you know, how stuff happens and what are we going to do and all of that. And we make a decision of, as, as a church and we, and we vote on it because we are congregational rule. Because we believe that the church, the members of the local church are the ones that are to govern the local church. And Baptists have always thought, you, guess what, you don't want unbelievers governing the local church. You, you, you don't want unbelievers governing the local church. And so they said, hey, we believe in congregational rule. And so we've got to have a regenerate church membership because we want believers, those who are living out their faith, making the decisions for the life of the church. We don't want a, a mixture of a bunch of weeds and unbelievers influencing how the church does its, its work. So really the, this distinctive of regenerate church membership went hand in hand and hand in glove with how we, we saw how the local, how, how the, how the local church was, you know, was to be governed and was to be ruled in church polity. Um, Anyway, I, I I hope that makes a, 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 a little bit a little bit of a sense. Uh, and th like I said, this is kind of our was our main distinctive. Um, that and it's why we do baptism the way we do baptism. In fact, I don't. Maybe next time we can talk a little bit about about baptism. But this, but but this this was a big a big issue and uh, an issue of separation on the issue of regenerate church membership, wanting a do all that we can to have a pure church. Yeah, did you have something there? Well, hey, we got we got. Is that ten minutes? Y'all want to get out ten minutes early? We got regenerative is, is saying that a person is being born. Been born again. Yeah, re re regeneration, that new life that you must be born again. And so it's just saying that the, the that the, the people within the life of the church, the members of the local church, should be actual born again Christians. And that you know the main issue was you don't bring your your kids in that have not yet been born again and don't have personal faith. They're they're not automatically in just because the parents are in. Uh, and so that, 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 you know, that was the issue. Of course, it had other, you know, other, other applications, but, but that was the main issue. In all other churches, if the parents were people of faith, then the kids, ought, then the whole the family got in. In fact, there were debates even in the congregational church over the uh, halfway covenant and kind of how this works with, with family. And it's these family affiliations, you know, and how do family affiliations affect the faith of the local church? And so that, you know, and, and, and Baptist came down different than the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, the Episcopalians, you know, all, all of these others. But. Um, I was going yes. to say a while ago, when, when you were talking about um, uh, listening to a sermon from my computer or something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that years ago I have an experience 
my younger child is my daughter, uh, and she has been married with my son-in-law for 23 years. And so in the, in the beginning of her marriage, um, we were meeting his family, my son-in-law's family, and things, you know, and I got invited to Life Church, and, uh, and I, I find out that the sermon was coming from a computer, and everybody here in the, uh, how you say, the sanctuary were eating and talking, and some were listening, you know, but everybody was doing what they want, and, and then they, the preacher said something about the Lord's Supper, and they got up and went to the side table, the old tables like that, and there were, in the beginning when I come in, I thought, there were snacks or appetizers. <laughs> Having little appetizers. Well, and, and then they go, well, maybe when I go out, I get one of those. You know? And I find that, 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 that was the bread and, and, and you know, and the cups disposable. And then whoever, you know, stand up and get it themselves and take it. And I go, what is this? <laughs> I don't want to ever come back in here, you know. But like you, you're talking about faith, a true believer. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have faith, I'm going to enjoy a, a preacher what he's saying because I know he he has been with God and he's talking. You know, he represents God or he's talking about God's word. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm going to enjoy the praising and, and the reading of the Bible and everything. You know, because I have that faith, I have that joy. And I can feel it from my fellow believers, you know, my the people of the church. Well, th thank th yeah, thanks for sharing that. But that is so important when we come together as a local church to for it to be everything that we do. It's it's part of our faith. This is not just a religious ritual. It's not just a religious exercise that we go through and oh, it's Sunday morning or Sunday whatever, and we go and we just to check the box, you know. This is our life, and this is an expression of our faith in our Savior, you know. And so, so Baptists really wanted to do all that we could say, hey, this is what the local church should be about. Uh, and, you know, this time for everybody, all the, the members to express our personal faith, not just religious rituals, but a, a personal faith in, you know, in the Lord Jesus Christ in every, in every aspect of it. You know, like you said, not, it's not just the preaching, but the singing, the playing, the giving, the prayer, everything. You know, it, it's our personal faith and to encourage that in other people and, it's, and to dissuade people away from having a trust in just a religious ritual or a family affiliation. You know, was it, the, don't trust a family affiliation. Don't trust a religious ritual. You got to have faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I wonder how they would reconcile, though, if you said that if they're saying that your children are automatically in, how would they reconcile that with you know, people have an individual free will? That's almost like saying your children do not have free will. Well, did uh, like did different like Lutherans will see it a little different than the Episcopalians or the Presbyterians. I mean, they they view it a little bit uh, different. Somehow, I think uh, Lutherans they believe in bap some of them hold to baptismal regeneration. That when the infant is baptized, they're actually born again. And that kind of comes from from uh, Roman Catholicism. I, the, the most Presbyterians would not not hold to that. It's just kind of they're just brought into the covenant community, and there's a promise to the to the parents. They're in the you know in the covenant, so that they do view it differently in that. But Baptists kind of said, no, we don't want any part of that. You know, we just we're that family affiliation doesn't guarantee anything. That's not, um, you know, there, there is, a, I think in the Bible, you know, promises to, to believing parents, especially the death of a, of a child, and we have other promises apart from a religious ritual. You know, it's just for the promise of God and the work of Christ. But, you know, did you have a, somebody had a, I thought so. Oh, oh, oh. But I thought when an infant died when he was young before, I thought he was saved already. Yeah, we we yeah we we would hold that the that the benefits of the death of Christ uh, accrue that 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 uh, to to infants 
Um, you know, so we, you know, especially the, the uh, believing parents that there is a, there's a promise uh, given given to believing parents and so but it's it's not because of, of a family affiliation but because of the grace of the Lord Jesus and so but we don't we don't put any stock in a religious ritual that oh well if they went through that they're in otherwise they're in limbo uh, no it's it, it's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is the reason any of us are, are saved the uh, argument is is to the age of accountability and what is that age yeah, there's, you know, so, so that there's different ways that different groups, you know, the age of accountability or a covenant relationship. So different Christian groups have tackled that issue in, in, in different ways. Uh, but some of them with the, the infant baptism is the way is the way they tackle it. It's not an age, it's a stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, I, that, that's a good one. I hadn't heard that. That's, that's a good one. I like it. Yes, sir. Did you have a question or was comment? No. Okay, just posture. Yes. One more thing. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I thought I don't want to. To me, what a person believes in infant baptism, they don't understand what baptism is. You know, yeah. Because John the Baptist came preaching to repent mm-hmm. uh, and be baptized. Yeah, baptism exactly. is the indication of repentance, yeah. it's not of something other than itself. Yeah. It's that it does. Yeah, you, you, you're exactly right. And so we see baptism as an expression of something that's already happened, you know, of repentance and faith and the baptism of the Spirit. These things have already happened in the life of the believer. And then we do this water baptism as a picture to something that's already happened, where in a lot of the other groups, you go through the ritual first. And some of it, it's as a faith that it's going to happen in the future or that it's happening then, you know. And so there's, there's different views that different groups have. But, but, but this was a big, a big, big Baptist distinctive. But, yes, sir. One other thing, hopefully very quickly. What I like about Baptist, which I am in, you know, I grew up in the Catholic um, doctrines, whatever, you know. But when I got married 50 years ago, I... Uh, <laughs> I, after a while, I was I become a believer. But what I like about Baptist, um, Southern Baptist, is that when when the church know that somebody is in sin and doing wrong things, mm-hmm. you know the Bible says, talk to him or her individually, mm-hmm. and if he or her did not listen, uh, you know, tell the church and do a three go and talk. And if still on you just treat him like you know any other unbeliever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that 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 was a big a big thing in, in Baptist churches that you have to have an evident Christian life, otherwise the church views them as an unbeliever. That if there's no evidence of faith, then you treat them as an unbeliever. Right. You know. And so, yeah, that's... Uh, and that keeps the, the church pure. Yeah. Like, and that, that, that was part of the quest of Baptist. Like we do all we can. To change, you know, but they want to stay in there. Okay, but, you know... And, and we have this problem in Baptist churches today that someone can be baptized at six years old and never, ever give any evidence of a life of faith. And people still want to say, well, they're still a believer. Well... If there's no evidence, then that ritual of baptism didn't do anything. If there's no expression of personal faith, and so we, we don't give anyone assurance because they went through baptismal waters. Uh, you know, there has to be a, a life of faith. Otherwise, if there's no life of faith and no good confession of faith, then we consider them an unbeliever, even though they went through a religious ritual. You know, whereas in other groups, the religious ritual puts them in. We say, no, unless there's that personal faith expressed and evident, then we consider them an unbeliever. Uh, the religious ritual doesn't change that. My own experience with my two children, I have a son, the one that's in the military. He got baptized at eight, uh, six years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he and my daughter, because she saw her brother getting baptized at six, she wanted to get baptized, yeah. you know? And now he's he's close to the Lord, he's giving evidence that he have a life, you know, a faith, and she doesn't, you know? And she, but I, I did not stop her, and I talked to the preacher, and he said, well, nothing, 
can't stop her from doing it so early, you know. But I just pray. I know she she relates, and I just pray to God that my daughter Elizabeth come back, you know, to him because. Yeah, and th those are hard, hard situations. I mean, I, you know, I, I understand that. You know, I, I can understand that. And that's why this issue you know, is such a powerful pull because it's dealing with family and children and, you know, the church and salvation. And, and we, we want to ensure it. I want to pass it down. Uh, but it's, it's got to come from their own heart. Well, why don't we close in, in prayer and then we'll, we want to talk some more after as we can. Our Father, Lord, we do thank you for the gift of faith. And we pray for those uh, in our family and our friends that have not yet trusted in your Son. And Father, we would ask that you would be gracious to them, that the work of your Spirit might be upon their life, that you might convict them of sin and of righteousness and of the judgment to come. Lord, that you might... Um, change their hearts uh, and so that they might see the beauty of your son and believe in him for life everlasting and i pray in christ's name amen